blur. I know. And then, look, November feels like a respite, and then December's always frantic, and then this escape the dance, which makes it exciting. Thank you. But at least you're too bad. Yeah, it's much different. Okay. So it's not exactly. We will uh, get started. We will. Good evening. Good evening. Oh. We'll start with the roll call by the town clerk. There's not many people here. Chairman McKenney? Here. Councillor Backer? Present. Councillor Dill? Here. Councillor Lennon? Here. Councillor Lynch? Here. Councillor Rowe? Here. Councillor Swift Cayetta? Here. Okay. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It will begin with a review of the minutes of meeting number 14, held September 10th, 2007. Someone like to make a motion? Oh, I would move that we accept the minutes. Do we have a second? I would, would second them, but I have one correction. Absolutely. What, what correction? On page th three, it's just a typo, but it's somebody's name, so I thought it, uh, the third paragraph down, mm. Tom Egan, I believe he spells his name E-G-A-N. That's correct. Yeah. But other than that, I <laughs> have nothing. Okay, any other corrections or amend, uh, changes? Okay, all in favor? Thank you. All right. Now we will move on to reports and correspondence. And um, I would like to start that with a um, report regarding our own counselor, Ann swift -Giata. And I'd like to congratulate Ann on her recent election to the presidency of the Maine Municipal Association. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And, and, and several counselors attended uh, the function last uh, week. And we were uh, very impressed with Ann's comments and uh, what she plans to do over the coming year. So, well, th thank you very much, if I might. And I wanted to thank Mike McGovern publicly because he's the one who encouraged me a number of years ago to become more um, involved with MMA. And I want to thank all my fellow counselors, including past counselors, um, who have been a source of great encouragement and support and good ideas and. Uh, I, I really appreciate all your help, and I look forward to doing the best I can for you at MMA. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations, Ann. And who else has uh, reports and correspondence to share? Jim. Um, as voted at, at our September meeting, uh, we are in the process of forming a citizen committee which will examine the state of agriculture in the town. Um, it's our expectation to eventually bring to the council for consideration uh, some recommendations which we hope will en en enhance the long-term vitality and viability of our working farms. Um, the committee is calling itself, uh, strangely enough, the Cape Elizabeth Farm Committee. <laughs> uh, currently we have an organizational or steering group of six to eight people uh, who are meeting weekly. I just came from a meeting uh, over in the Land Trust building. It's our intent to uh, soon expand and include all the major stakeholders in Cape Elizabeth's farming community. This will be the Cape Elizabeth Farm Committee. This will be the Cape Elizabeth Farm Committee once we are expanded. Um, we are planning a kickoff meeting for the full committee uh, tentatively for November 14 uh, at Sprague Hall, the Cape Elizabeth Grange, uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. And all are invited to attend, particularly we'd like to see uh, the Cape's working farmers and uh, possibly large land owners uh, of arable land. Uh, in the meantime, we're busy engaging prospective committee members, uh, enlisting experts who will present topic-specific presentations to the group, compiling a farm profile, and beginning to identify the real challenges that our farmers face. Uh, I also attended the second meeting of the Fire Department uh, Strategic Planning Committee you may or may not recall that the purpose of that committee is to study our volunteer emergency services and to develop recommendations which will address growing challenges in an environment where the volunteer pool is dwindling. Um, this latest meeting I attended exposed to us the fact that Cape Elizabeth is not alone here. This is not a Cape Elizabeth phenomenon. It's nationwide. Um, other communities across the country are facing the same challenges, and we'll meet again soon, uh, tentatively October 25th, 
to begin exploring what our options might be for a town. And on the lighter side, I was happy to participate in the recent town employee golf tournament at Bakuda Club. Uh, thanks to Police Captain uh, Brent Sinclair for organizing that event, and also thanks to teammates Neil, Keith, Kevin, and Roz for leading our team to victory. Uh, following the town council's devastating defeat in the spelling bee, I am, uh, <laughs> it was a personal joy to taste the thrill of victory at the golf tournament. So. <laughs> As opposed to the agony of defeat. The agony of defeat. <laughs> You're lucky we weren't golfing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. Okay, any other reports and correspondence? Marianne. I have a report. Um, I've been attending the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee uh, as one of the elected representatives representing municipal government. Um, our role is just advisory. And um, I guess my roll back to you is just as a reporter, things look very dismal um, as far as the Cumberland County budget. Uh, the Cumberland County budget right now is looking like it will be over a 10% increase from last year, which translates to over an 8% increase to um, taxpayers and to the towns. Um, I wish the Budget Advisory Committee had um, more authority over it. Um, I learned today we have one of the most expensive jails in the nation. Not the state, not the Northeast, but the nation. And there just seems to me to be um, a real absence of hard questioning and benchmarking and trying to figure out why that is. Um, as you all have worked with me on our budget, so you know that I am asking those questions, but I'm not getting any satisfactory answers. Um, and uh, it just does not look good for the Cumberland County budget process. Th thank you for the update, Marianne. Anybody else? Cynthia. Well, just along those same lines, I'm attending the Criminal Justice Summit in Augusta on October 30th. So I would love to be armed with a lot of helpful information and welcome um, any information um, that I can bring to Augusta on Tuesday 30th. Okay. Okay. I, I have one other piece of information to share with everybody and with the public. Um, as I was arriving at this meeting, I bumped into the um, chair of the school committee and the superintendent, and they informed me and asked me to inform everybody else that uh, the school just received notification today that they will retain their independent status. So that's uh, good news. <laughs> and what I'd like to do is thank all of the counselors that uh, contributed to the, this effort. And I would particularly like to thank Representative Cynthia Dill for her effort in making this uh, happen. And what I think it's important, what is important for the public to understand is that um, in Cape Elizabeth, we have what we call a one town concept. And it's pretty unique uh, compared to most communities in the fact that we share many positions between the school system and the town. So there's a lot of overlap, positions that serve both entities. And if we were to consolidate it would be very expensive for the town of Cape Elizabeth, both on the school side and the municipal side, we would see our costs go up. So this is a really big deal for the town. It's going to be real beneficial. So anything else, Anne? Um, in, on that same subject, first of all, I would like to thank Cynthia. She made a huge difference up, up in Augusta for our town. And I hope that every parent and student and teacher and just citizen of Cape Elizabeth realized that her efforts really made it so that we could um, be in a, uh, the exception of high performing cost efficient school systems which are um, accepted from uh, having to merge with other towns like South Portland. Um, however, I was at a meeting last week with Susan Gendron who is the Commissioner of Education um, and uh, up at the MMA convention and uh, it was very clear from what was being said that the uh, 
effort will be there among some people at least to try to change those rules. And so I would say eternal vigilance may be <laughs> what, we, what we have to uh, make sure we're, we're, we're doing because uh, the, the, the state DOE does not appear to like that high performing cost efficient exception. They like consolidation for some reason. I mean, I thought the point was to be high performing and cost efficient, but I'm not sure that everyone is of the same mind in Augusta. So um, the fight is one for this year due in great part to Cynthia's efforts and, and many other people's, but um, especially the school department uh, and the town, which has been uh, very cost efficient. And by being cost efficient, if we weren't cost efficient, we wouldn't have had this exception. So, but uh, going on next year, we may have to fight the battle all over again. Okay. Thank you very much. We will move on to the manager's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, we, uh, the superintendent did give me a copy of the letter late today and following up on that discussion. Uh, this, they did an audit of our administrative expenses for system administration and determined that our per pupil expenditures represents 3.1% of total per pupil expenditures. Uh, that's less than the 4% per pupil expenditure requirement for system administration. Uh, that sets the key number 3.1% uh, rather than, uh, which is less than the 4%. Also, uh, did want to mention that paving on Shore Road is now ongoing again. Uh, weather permitting, it'll be ongoing the next couple of days. Uh, so we, we'll get a smoother surface there relatively soon. The traffic light at the high school, that work is also progressing. <laughs> However, the uh, the actual lighting fixtures apparently are somewhat delayed according to the contractor. Probably will be the beginning of November or so, uh, and that date is sketchy, uh, before uh, those, those will go in. So uh, a little bit delayed on that. Uh, next point I wanted to mention. Do you have a question, Cynthia, on no, that? No. If you, when you're done, I just realized I have an important announcement. Okay. <laughs> and I just wanted to uh, thank the public safety folks uh, for all their, their work with the gas issues. And I've had a number of discussions with uh, Chief McGoldrick. He is meeting directly with the, the Public Utilities Commission to express some concerns. And we've had concern for a while uh, about some of the record keeping at Northern Utilities, their, their inability to, to find certain lines, their, their responsiveness. And we'll be communicating all of that uh, to the Public Utilities Commission. And hopefully uh, the agent, the, they'll be more responsive uh, uh, the old Northern Utilities Portland Gas Company, you know, used to have quite a presence in the area. They had local people you can talk to. That hardly seems to be the case anymore. And it just seems to be, you know, it, it reminds me of the school reorganization debate. Uh, you know, small units sometimes work better than, than big, in that case, multi-state units. And uh, while, you know, we don't know the cause, well we, well, we do know the cause of what happened the other day. We, we don't know the systemic issues. Uh, we can't definitely conclude what, what led to them, uh, but it, it's, it's very good that the, uh, the main PUC is going to be taking a look uh, at the operations of Northern Utilities uh, to ensure the, the safety of the gas system and the safety of our citizens. So, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Cynthia. I'm sorry. Um, I meant to announce that the design workshop for the um, intersection of Shore Road and Route 77 um, is going to be held on October 27th from 9 a.m., 8 a.m. until noon here at the town hall, and, and the public is welcome to attend. It's just to um, work together and try to strategize and um, bring some synergies to ideas surrounding the intersection, how to beautify it, make it more pedestrian friendly, and um, otherwise make it um, a reflection of what we value here in Cape Elizabeth. So October 27th, 8 to noon here in town hall. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, I did want to mention as well, and maybe this would be a good time, that, that David Weatherby, the president of the Beach to Beacon Board of Directors, uh, and Joan Benoit Samuelson are here this evening uh, for a presentation. Okay. Would you like to uh, come on up and sure. <laughs> take the floor? <clears throat> well, welcome. Okay. It's good to have you. Want me to go first? Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, um, as, as you all know, this year was the 10th running uh, of Beach to Beacon. 
And um, Joan, obviously Joan and I have been involved all the way back till before then uh, in planning the first one. And, um, you know, a little bit of trepidation going into the first year, you know how things are when they're new in this town. Either people either love them or they don't. And um, this was, uh, we couldn't have asked for uh, just better cooperation from not only the town council, but Mike McGovern and his staff, um, all of the residents, you know, the 500 plus volunteers, you know, more than half of our volunteer group comes from this town. There's 600 residents of Cape that run in this race every single year. Um, they've really embraced this event, and we can't thank all those constituencies uh, enough. And, um, you know, as a small token of our appreciation here tonight, we would like to make a, a donation to Fort Williams in the amount of uh, $5,000, just as a okay. small way to say thank you for all that you've done for this race. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to add that um, the town of Cape Elizabeth and its citizenry um, have been absolutely wonderful. Um, as I said early on, um, with the founding of this race, I thought the town of Cape Elizabeth would either embrace this event, and I recently heard the term radical inclusion, which means, you know, you don't stand like this and you don't stand like this, but you, you know, or the community would embrace us and it has radically included us in, in a heartfelt way. And um, my first steps uh, as a runner were taken in Cape Elizabeth because I was trying to uh, avoid uh, having a tomboy image and there wasn't any vehicular traffic allowed in Fort Williams at that time so that was one place I could go and run and hide. Um, little did I know it would become the backdrop of one of the most prestigious road races in the country again thanks to the citizenry of the people of uh, uh, Cape Elizabeth and the surrounding areas. And uh, before we hand over the check, um, this race has really um, transcended the sport of running in so many ways. It's reached out into the community. One of our first beneficiaries was uh, Camp Sunshine, and I'm honored to uh, be able to introduce a fellow Olympic teammate of mine from the 84 Olympic Games, Karen Smith from California, who just finished a week of volunteer work at Camp Sunshine. Welcome. So. Um, Karen, thank you for joining us, and I think Karen exemplifies what all the volunteers mean to our race, and um, just thank you one and all. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. On behalf of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, we really appreciate this, and it's a great race. I only got to run in it once. Every time I've tried to sign up since, it's been full. <laughs> I gotta, I've got to sign up real early now. <laughs> but uh, you, you do a great job. We really appreciate it. Okay. Now, we will move on to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is, are there any citizens that would like to discuss any items that do not appear on our agenda this evening? All right, now we move to the item 134, adoption of comprehensive plan. Do we have a motion? Sure. Um, I'd like to make a motion. Um, I would like to make a motion that we um, adopt the comprehensive plan. Uh, actually, before we do that, we have to have a motion to get it, take it off the table. Oh, I'm sorry. I will move to remove it from the table. We have a second. second. Okay. All in favor? Okay, now, do we have a motion to adopt the plan? And now I would move um, to adopt the comprehensive plan. Second. Any discussion? Is there any discussion? Yes. Um. Okay. Well, Cynthia, go ahead. Um, I had a just a couple of questions that um, um, in paragraph 84 where it talks about making the open space impact fee not applicable. I just had a quick question. Is, is, does this give people a choice? They can either pay the fee or provide the open space? No, um, no it doesn't. 
Uh, what we have, I mean, we have cluster development regulations that require that 40% of the gross land area have to be set aside as open space. But not all subdivisions are clustered subdivisions. Some of them are what we consider the traditional subdivision. And even in a traditional subdivision, you're required to set aside a certain amount of land as open space. Um, because of some Supreme Court decisions in the 90s, we form reformatted our, our set-aside requirement as an impact fee. Um, so if you have a traditional subdivision, you would still have to set aside open space. It's usually, it's almost always land. Um, it's, I think we've never collected a fee. And what we found is there was, we had one instance where a development was an open space subdivision, a, a cluster subdivision, and it contradicted the open space impact fee. Usually the impact fee was here and the open space zoning was up here in terms of what you got. And we just wanted to clarify in case that ever happened again that if you're in a cluster development, the cluster provisions for open space are the ones that apply. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I just clarify something? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Because I, I think that um, it sounds like from your question that you think it, because it's in the plan, the change happens. And I think it's important for people to, to really understand, um, and especially for the public to understand, that this is a concept, a vision. And no matter what the plan says tonight, and we want to have zoning that is consistent with the plan, but this is a concept and a vision. And everything, including what you just asked about, actually would still require a subsequent change in the zoning ordinance. And so. Um, ultimately, we'll have a package that will come from the planning department to the council. We'll refer it to the planning board. They'll have hearings. They'll have discussions. They'll send it back to us. We'll refer it to the ordinance committee, and it will come back to us. And there'll be hearings and public input all through that. But anything that we adopt, for instance, talking about the open space impact fee in the language tonight doesn't change our existing land use regulations. And I just want to make sure that's correct. We're all really clear about that. Go ahead. Thank you, Marianne. I'll re my second question, I'm going to reword a little bit then. Is the, um, is the concept, as it is described in the proposed comprehensive plan in paragraph 86 now, shifting a little bit, mm -hmm. um, it talks about reducing the minimum lot size required for multiplex housing in the RC district from five acres to three acres, and then it says eliminate the minimum lot size for multiplex housing in the RB district. Yep. And so am I correct in understanding that the concept mm -hmm. is then that in the RB district there would be no minimum lot size for multiplex housing? What, what that means right now, you need to have a minimum amount of land to even be considered for <coughs> open space for cluster development. If you don't have a minimum a number of acres, you have to go with the traditional subdivision. So when we say eliminate minimum lot sizes, we're not talking about eliminating the, minimum, the lot size for individual lots for homes. We're saying that the threshold of how much land you have before you can consider looking at a cluster development is being taken out in the RB. So, and the reason you take it out in the RB is the, there were only large lots that were zoned RB when it was done in 1997. I think the, probably the smallest lot was eight or nine acres. And we were really in like the 10 acre area. So we know that we're still working with a fairly large amount of land. So you don't really need that lot size to be able to apply for the open space zoning provisions. And in the RC district, we actually ran into some situations where there was a lot that was right around a little over three acres and it couldn't come in for a cluster development proposal, even though most of the people who came forward said this is a great opportunity to do that in that area. The only thing you could look at was a traditional subdivision. So that's what that, that paragraph 86 is talking about, is eliminating the threshold that you have to get over in order to look at using those provisions if you want to develop the land. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, several of the emails we got referred to the, um, the yellow area that's the sort of high growth, designated high growth, that there were lots of wetlands there and marshes and so forth, and questioning, you know, sort of why was that the area that we had chosen to try to steer the growth. <clears throat> What's your 
response to them. Yeah, the, the and even growth, talk about soil quality. Yeah, the and growth th areas are we. The the company. It's ironic. I actually had a call today from a man in Seattle who wrote the comprehensive plan that we have right now. And I said, I can't talk long because I have a meeting tonight. Uh, <laughs> but I said, they keep asking me how you found these growth areas. <laughs> and the, what happened when the, the original plan was adopted is the committee in 1989, 88 to 90 found the areas in town that they felt could best support new development while still preserving the character of the community. So they did look at limiting factors. But the reality is that you know, Cape Elizabeth is one of those communities that has a lot of wetlands. So if they were to say, for example, propose a growth area south of Wells Road, where we know we've got a lot of, of high value for wildlife type saltwater marshes, that would make a lot of sense. But they did try to pick areas like the area bounded by Spurwink, Wells, Sawyer, and Sawyer, that is relatively less wet than the other parts of town. Um, but you won't find any part of town that doesn't have any wetland. So that's the first answer. The second answer is just because it's designated as a growth area doesn't mean that the wetland protections don't still apply. So the only portions of the growth area in that area that can be developed are the portions outside of the wetlands and the wetland buffers. And one clarification or, or expansion on that, Maureen, is that our wetland buffers are significantly greater than a typical wet, wetland buffer you'll find elsewhere. Is that true? Absolutely. Okay. So that's that's an important thing to remember when we're, when we're considering this. Any other comments? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple. Oh, David, go ahead. Um, along the wetlands buffer issue, do you want to? On that? Well, I already I called Maureen and it was a, a mistake in it's the fixed. deletion, and I think she's fixed it in the draft. And there's no one. Just to so, explain, so, so, handwritten. So this is different than the only difference. Packet. The only difference in that <laughs> is, is an error that I made that we fixed by hand on page 29 in corresponding and, error in the back of the list. And let me explain. That is the wetland. Um, that's the setbacks in the business zone, that one little tiny um, business zone. Um, th it was predicated on requiring a hookup to public water and sewer, and that language was missing, and I discovered that language missing this morning, and I called Maureen, and she's put that in. So it's, but that was the sole, I mean, that was the key environmental protection, and it just, it's back in. So. Okay. Thank you very so, much. That's that's good. Could idea. I just add? So where where is this? Where page, was this change? Page twenty eight. Page twenty eight. And it should be handwritten in your copy. What I did is you've gotten three sets of revisions at this point. So the last set of revisions, all of the revisions are shown in this. Oh, I see it. I see it. Okay. Twenty eight, and then it will be in one more. And it's also in the back, page one fifty. Yeah, right around yeah, there. Something like that. Anyway. One fifty seven. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just was a little lost for a minute. That's Thanks. Good. It's one of those times when you say, "Does pay to read these things." For us so we could get, you know, That's why they on the committee. <laughs> they know it by heart. Any other? Can I ask another question? Absolutely. <laughs> this is more abstract, <laughs> but Maureen. I think a lot of people in town are concerned by this, the, the, incre the proposal or the concept to increase the density in that area. And part of their concern, I think, is just aesthetics. So if, you, if we could time tunnel 20 years ahead from now and look at the town with the two scenarios, one where there's the increased density and one where there's not, what's your vision of how it would be different? Just you're driving down Spurwink or you're driving down Sawyer. Wouldn't there be any sort of visible difference? I, I think the visible difference is that I, you know, I've had this conversation with several of you at this point, but the whole idea of what is rural character. And I think if you were to spend the time and have uh, professional visual preference surveys done, most people would say that visual, that, that, that rural character to them is when they drive by the town farm when they drive down the southern end of Bowery Beach Road, where you have the wide open fields, you don't see many houses at all. 
And once you start seeing houses on a regular basis, even a low density area where you say have three acre lots, it doesn't look rural anymore. It starts to look suburban. So I think if the town wants to preserve that rural character, as I think what they mean, you need to save large pieces of land intact. Having, having small strips behind lots, having um, bigger yards that are still part of landscaped areas doesn't get you that rural character. So I think the, the more compact clustering will result in more land that can be left alone completely where you have more areas where it's just native woodlands that haven't been touched, where you wind a little trail through it. Uh, that's what I see as a difference. Can I, um, you know, at the, the state level, there's smart growth, and there's the big smart growth summit coming up, and the chartering Maine's future, the report that came out that just talks about the vision for Maine's future. I mean, everything about this comprehensive plan, at least from my view, is consistent with the more progressive um, smart growth philosophies that are being talked about in order to sort of preserve um, the quality of life here. Is that, isn't that true? I would completely agree with that. <laughs> I would say, you know, in terms of suburbs that, and I've said before, Cape is a mature suburb. You're, you're a little bit ahead of the development curve of most of the other suburbs, and I think your regulations reflect that maturity, where I think you're, you're far ahead of a lot of suburbs in terms of embracing the smart growth comps, concepts. And therefore, I'm really supportive of the plan. I just want to thank the whole Comprehensive Plan Committee for doing a spectacular job. I mean, I just think it's, it's very, very impressive, and I feel very fortunate to be in a town where so much energy was put into planning for the future, because I really think, you know, a vision is, is half the battle. So thank you, Maureen. Okay. Um, Maureen, I, I have a few questions, just to, I want to make sure we have clarification, because we did get, we did receive a lot of emails, and I think there was a lot of confusion about what density means and what this change might mean. So I want to see if we can clarify that. Um, number one, what it means for non-conforming lots is nothing. It doesn't change anything for non-conforming lots. There's absolutely no change. And actually, the comprehensive plan has a paragraph that says okay. the committee thought about it, and there is no proposed changes to non-conforming lots. Okay, secondly, what, what this plan proposes is a reduction in lot size from 30,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet, correct? Not, not lot size, I'm sorry, because um, you, you did correct me the other day. Density. In density. Yes. From 30 to 20, but really when we look at it practically, it's, it's more like 22 or 23 when you, when, if you were really trying to, to try to build out. So it's really not that big of a reduction. But what it does is it reduces the lot size from 10,000 square feet to 7,500 so that you can have more dense development and therefore you're getting more efficient growth on the same land. Is that yes. accurate? Yes. Yes. Okay. And one of the requirements in the plan would be that these developments, whatever might develop in the future, would be hooked up to public sewer. Yes. As well, correct? Okay. And, and would it be accurate to say that we're not promoting growth, but we're really directing growth where, where it would be in the town? Yes. And does our, the RB district comprise about 7% of the town? Yes. Okay. So this doesn't affect the other 93%? No. Okay. Um, okay. Now, when, when you develop land like this, as Cynthia um, mentioned, it is more environment, environmentally friendly. That's true, right? Yes. It increases or, or maintains wildlife habitat and reduces fragmentation? Yes. It's, it provides for less paving and less stormwater issue, yes. storm mm -hmm. issues? Yes. Le less driving, less pollution? Absolutely. Okay. Lower municipal costs long term? 
there are, and you have the study from the Brookings Institute, which is the same institute that did the charting range future study, and they've looked at, you know, it, it gets bigger if you have more development, but yes, compact development is less expensive to serve. So less miles of infrastructure, less infrastructure overall, that would include roads, sidewalks, water lines, sewer lines, plowing issues, and, and maintenance operating costs as well. Yes. In the, in the Brookings report, the reduction in costs was somewhere between 12 and 20 plus percent. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Sarah. Sorry, it's not a question. It's a, just an observation. My, my concern, my ongoing concern, and um, is that. I feel that the people in the town, um, or the people that we've heard from in the town, aren't happy with it, with the increased density. It's the one piece in this whole huge um, study that I continue to have problems with. And it's mostly because m many people have contacted us and expressed a high level of concern about it. And no one's contacted us and said, I think it's a great idea. So I, I guess. Although I personally have become far more convinced that that um, that den higher density is okay and cluster zoning is okay, I don't feel like the town feels that way, and I feel like that this comprehensive plan should be a reflection of what the citizens of the town want. So I guess I guess for me, I'm finding it really hard to vote it in tonight because I feel that we that one of two things should happen: either the the public should be um, should be better informed that they, so that they feel good about it too, like they should be able to come along the process that all of us have, or alternatively that they should be able to convince us that it's actually not a good idea. And I understand that that can go on indefinitely and that a lot of that already has gone on, but I don't feel that from their point of view they have any, that they've reached any conclusion or they feel any more settled about it. So I'm sitting here wrestling with what to do. Sure. Um, I'm going to respond. I, I spent a lot of time talking to Maureen. I was confused. I, I feel like, I mean, my, my formal graduate education is in public administration. I had some sense of this prior to seeing it. So, and I didn't understand it all, even with the document. I had to sit down with an expert and get clarification. And that's why I'm going over these issues, because it is confusing. And when you talk about density versus lot size, that's confusing. Um, so what I've discovered with, the, at least with the emails that I have seen, most people who are against the density issue don't really understand it. And, and I will be frank and say that I didn't fully understand it myself until I sat down over several, several times with Maureen to get clarification and to really get my head wrapped around what this means. And I would say that um, people who really think and believe that they're environmentalists and they care about open space and they want intelligent development and they want reasonable taxes or, or low taxes in the future or lower costs would support this once they understood it. That's my belief. And I have a lot of faith in the people. I think they are very intelligent, but that's why we get elected. That's why we have a, an expert town planner, because we can't know everything. So we have to trust that people who are going to look into it in depth are going to understand it better and give us good, reasonable, rational arguments to go in one direction versus another. And that's why I, want, I will support this. That's the conclusion that I've come to, Sarah. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's my thought process. David. Um, did you want to go first? Oh, I'm sorry. Or, or I'll be happy. Yeah. I'm sorry. I sort of, no, it's okay. I know it's hard when you're in the middle. You sort of get that whiplash thing. I, I just wanted to respond very briefly sure. to Sarah because she, she brings up some excellent points. However, I would um, note that we have heard, we the council, now perhaps you've gotten a lot of other separate emails, but we've heard from 15 different households who had questions about density. Um, and that is 
perfectly appropriate. I mean, that's what people are supposed to be doing, asking questions. It, it has been apparent to me that some of them did not, like Paul, like myself, like all of us, did not completely understand every nuance. Um, I think um, I, along with the other members of the Comprehensive Plan Committee, have had the benefit of working on this project for two years. And Maureen can attest that I was slow at some points on, on the land use stuff. But I really um, have confidence that I understand it now. And um, the Comprehensive Plan Committee was a, a very mixed group. There are a lot of ardent environmentalists. Um, there, there was even an employee of the DEP there. And um, I, I think we came up with a good plan. And I would note also um, that the land trust has said that they uh, approve of the density aspects of this plan. And in fact, I would quote from them uh, uh, an email from Chris Franklin. I affirmed our view that the town has made smart planning decisions in the comp plan by encouraging added density and the creation of the 55 plus bonus. That refers to the age 55 plus bonus. Um, to be clear, Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is not opposed to the plan as written with respect to plan number of homes, clustering, and the 55 plus bonus. So I think people in town can have confidence that the land trust does a really excellent job of being watchdogs on uh, everything that's going on in town about environmental issues and land use issues. And uh, I am very pleased and proud to be standing side by side with the land trust in supporting this aspect of the comprehensive plan. That's, that's an excellent point. And, and, and I would also note that we heard from the land trust and we got some, we received some excellent uh, input and we incorporated that into the plan. So, anybody else? David, please. Um, yeah, and I'd like to respond as well. And I think Sarah knows, the whole council knows, <laughs> that, that initially I struggled with, well, it wasn't just initially, probably, as you've seen from my emails over the weekend, I was struggling with fully understanding the concept. But, um, <coughs> Oh, before I comment on this, I do want to commend Maureen for one bit that she did add to the plan at our request after the last workshop. And I'd like to note that because I think it's an important addition um, in conjunction with this density discussion as well. And it's in the land use section, the new language that has been added. It's on page 148. Um, and it's a paragraph that says, the town is committed to preserving its rural character by using a variety of measures, including exacting review of new developments, using the least amount of land necessary to accommodate new development, purchase and preservation of undeveloped land, and preservation of working farms. This comprehensive plan's goal is to manage the low level of growth that occurs in a manner that preserves the town's rural character and not to promote an accelerated rate of growth. And I think that that um, nicely captures some of the sort of global concerns about sort of interpreting the plan. But more importantly, a number of the emails that we've received over the last couple of weeks addressing the density issue um, suggests that the increased density is inconsistent with the comprehensive plans stated goal of preserving open space. And I didn't understand that initially. I think I do understand it well now and understand it to be entirely consistent with the preservation of open space. If you assume that there will be X number of homes built in Cape Elizabeth over the course of the next 10 years, it doesn't matter what that number is. Um, if our goal is to preserve open space, which it is, we want that number of homes, whatever that number is, ideally to be built on smaller rather than larger lots, simply because the more compact the development, the greater the preservation of open space. And it minimizes urban sprawl. Urban sprawl has been such a problem with communities all around the southern Maine Portland area. 
and it's why people who live in Port, who work in Portland now have to live in Standish and Wyndham and Raymond and points beyond because of sprawl and because of cost, because of other factors, but sprawl is a big factor in it. Um, in, although people who live in Cape Elizabeth today will be affected to some extent by the decision we make in this plan, I'm looking out to the next generation and the generation beyond. And every 10 years, these little incremental savings and preserving of open space simply by reducing the number of acres that need to be developed to accommodate additional growth will become significant over 10 years and more significant over 20 years and even more significant over 50 years. So I think that to the extent that people have said this increased density is inconsistent with preserving open space, I think they're missing the point. I think it's entirely consistent with it. Um, increased density does not mean accelerated growth. And one of the emails that we've received suggested that, um, that it does mean increased growth. And if you build it, people are going to snap up these places and it just means that Cape Elizabeth will develop even faster if you have greater density. And I think the evidence that that's an incorrect statement is present in, if you look at a realtor's website today, and see that there are 75 plus homes for sale in Cape Elizabeth right now. And they're sitting on the market. There's not a line of people clamoring to just run in and buy up and live in Cape Elizabeth. We had how many homes built in Cape last year? Ten. Ten, ten, ten homes. And the suggestion is that growth is actually slowing down. Um, so I think if our objective is to promote the preservation of open space, that this increased density makes sense to do. Um, and if the goal is to reduce, to do our part, to reduce urban sprawl, preserve open space, then it's incumbent upon us, not only for the current residents, but more importantly for the next generations, to permit these increased density developments that are required to create open space with them. Um, you know, this is a little bit of an aside, but I don't know whether um, years ago I visited um, a development north of Phoenix. It's called Arco Santi, um, developed by um, an architect by the name of Paolo Soleri. He's a, considered an a internationally renowned sort of cutting edge architect. And his, <laughs> design, the design of Arco Santi is to, it's an experimental town of sorts, and it's been under construction for 30 years, mm -hmm. is to house 5,000 people in 25 acres or so that live, work, everything in this very confined space. And the idea is to preserve all the surrounding open space. And Paolo Slurry, if you look at these drawings, he's, he's, these drawings, at least conceptually, he's created communities like this for 500,000 people or a couple of million people. But the idea, again, being incre massively increased the density to preserve open space for recreation. Now, we're not going to see an Arco Santi for a million people. We, we'll see Mars colonized before we see that. But the idea is the same. Um, and people cheer that. Environmentalists look at that kind of a design as really cutting edge and forward thinking as a way to preserve the environment. And this is just our very small part and way of achieving the same thing. So I realize that was a lot to say and I apologize for the length of it. But um, it's just a way of my explaining how I've come to, um, I won't say buy into this concept because that would be the wrong way to put it. It's to really embrace the concept and understand it as the right <coughs> developmental standard for Cape Elizabeth. Can I answer? Please. I agree with most of what you say, but what the detractors have have said to me is, you know, the, the, oh, this open space thing is driving everything to a degree that's become extreme. So although I agree that open space is our goal, and as you talk about to preserve the rural character, really people are talking about those vistas they drive by with open space. But, um, but they're not 
you know, when you ask people what your concern is, they don't just say, well, I want open space. They, they say they want a rural character, which, which I would say involves a little bit of both. So they don't want, you don't want to drive by development with like a gazillion houses and then a field. And then they want it to sort of look like Cape does now. And so the concern is if they, if with increased density, yes, you do get open space, but you get more crowded neighborhoods. And there are people who are willing to give up some open space to have less crowded neighborhoods. You're saying that you think that, it's, that the former is better, but I'm just trying to present their point of view. And, there, and the other overriding concern people have is that it won't, that ultimately all that land will be built up. It might stretch it out over longer, but those open spaces will also get developed and they will be developed at a higher density. Now I understand it's only 7% of the town, so in some ways it's, it's not worth arguing over all night. I'm just trying to explain. The people have come up to me and expressed concerns. Those are some of the themes that they, that they express. And, and in terms of saying, well, you know, it's kind of built out and there's all these houses on the market, that's, you could argue that's a short-term issue with all these subprime loans, and it's actually a nationwide phenomenon right now. So it's not guaranteeing that CAPE won't, again, see an accelerated growth and a desire to use all the pieces of land that we can. So that's just sort of the devil's advocate. And, and I, I actually understand both points of view. I'm, I'm going to just comment briefly, and then I'll, I'll give it over to you, Marianne. Um, one thing, one further thing to consider, Sarah, with this whole argument is that under this new uh, concept, if you will, 45% of the land versus currently we, we preserve 40%, but the, under the new concept, 45% of that land will be undeveloped forever. So it's, it, it can't get developed. I just want to point that out. Marianne? That's all I was okay. going to point out. So, so it really doesn't permanent. mean what Dedication. People might think it means, but and, and that's where the confusion lies, I think. That later that piece won't get built. It can't. Okay. It, it's impossible. In fact, it preserves more than we, we do now. And, and, and the other issue is it is, it is only 7% of the land, right. but it's still relevant. And people who live there, it's relevant to them, and I understand that and appreciate that. Okay, any other comments? Okay, that we I, I guess I, I just want to comment to, to Sarah. Um, because I know she has some concerns and other people in town do. And I worked, I served on the Comprehensive Plan Committee along with Ann, and um, I think it's fair to say that this is a great plan. But any single one of us who served on the committee ourselves might have one or two things in here that, gee, we didn't really agree with, but on balance, the, the plan, the vision was something that we really thought was good for the town. And so I think that's certainly for me that's the way that I've approached it. I um, think it is a wonderful plan and I think the committee worked very hard. Um, we made a lot of changes that we did in response to public comments, to um, uh, the land trust. Um, but I still can't say today I agree with all 87. Um, goals or things that we're, that we're hoping to implement. But I do think on balance, and that's how I look at this, on balance it's a good thing for the uh, town, it's a good plan, and, and I think really it is the beginning of a dialogue because we still have the planning board. And then th specific changes to zoning ordinances do come back to the council. So there's already been a dialogue for two years and lots of opportunity for public input. I appreciate the public input that we've had in the last week. I don't think that's any vote tonight is necessarily the end of it, but it's a really good plan, and I think for that reason alone, you should think about voting for it, even though you might not agree with all 90 or 89 um, implementation steps. So can I just ask her a clarifying question? Yes. So if we vote for this and it goes before the planning board and the planning board says, yeah, okay, we're on board with this density, isn't that then sort of a done deal? No. Then the planning board, there will be a draft proposal that will go to the planning board. They will vote a recommendation after they hold hearings. Then it will come back to the council, whoever is on the council at that point. And that will be the point at which there will be another public hearing and it would not be until that subsequent future council votes that you have what you want to characterize as a done deal, but a change to the 
zoning ordinances. There are no changes tonight, but this so says what is this our is a vision. Tonight? Our vote tonight is this is our vision for the town, and I will vote for this because I will say that in the 170 plus pages, I agree with 98% of it. I think it's a great vision for the town. And then we will start as a town to work on the vision. Okay. And can I also say one other thing? One other thing, please. Because, and, and I apologize for it, but okay. it, it came up because um, the staff document that we got on our revisions, on the vision statement said, the order of the qualities has been changed to <coughs> prioritize the preservation of open space, preservation of farmland, and the slow pace of development. And I just want to state that just speaking for myself, I don't see it as a list in terms of priority because, interestingly, the first draft in the Comprehensive Plan Committee was basically the way you see it tonight. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of people who came and said, we need to put schools first. So the Comprehensive Plan Committee put schools first. And then a couple of months ago, people came in and said, no, we need to put open space first. And I just want to say what's clear to me mm -hmm. is that all of these things are the highest priority for us as residents. And, and it's only because Maureen's paper to us um, in our packet stated that it was a prioritization that I feel the need to at least state for myself that I support the vision, but I think they're all of equally high priority and it is not a prioritization. Right. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Now, um, we're going to go to a vote here. Yeah, I want to say something. Please. Yeah, I, just before you vote on this, I, I know Maureen was thanked at the uh, the last meeting with the public hearing. I, I want to reiterate that and thank her. But j just as important, and I know Maureen would join me in saying this if I give her an opportunity, is that she worked with a very excellent committee uh, led by Barbara Schenkel, uh, made up, as, as uh, Ann Swift Keata just said, environmentally minded citizens. Uh, and, you know, Cape Elizabeth is very fortunate to have talented citizens on all its boards and commissions. And, and this committee in particular you know, was asked to do a lot more than a lot of other committees. They, they, how many meetings did they have, Maureen? 29, 29 meetings wow. to help prepare this document. And, you know, just tremendous leadership on the part of Barbara Schenkel in this committee. And Maureen, you know, responded to the, the different issues along the way. But it was very much a process driven by the committee. And I, I want to join Maureen in uh, thanking that committee uh, on behalf of the staff. Uh, it was just a, a good process. And, a good committee and I think good collaboration between the staff, in this case Maureen, I can't use we, I didn't do much, uh, and uh, the committee as well. So with the citizens, thank you. Thanks, Michael. And, and I, I would second Michael's uh, thank you from all of us. You know, we really appreciate it. Um, I think it was really important to discuss these issues and to uh, inform the public why we came to the conclusions we did because this document will be with us probably to 2020. So it, it's an important document and it's, it's gonna be valuable moving forward as a guide. So with that, 2020 all in favor of adopting the compre <laughs> adoption of the comprehensive plan. Okay, we have a unanimous, unanimous vote. Very good, thank you. It's always nice when everyone's on the same page. <laughs> Okay, let's move to a public hearing. Thank you for everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Jim Rowe will explain it first. Hmm? Jim Rowe will explain it. Yeah, I'm going to let Jim do that. Absolutely. Jim, you want to fill us in one? We're going to have a public hearing now. Um, before I open it, it's uh, on the proposed amendments to the signed ordinance. Jim, could you uh, fill us in, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you may remember from last month's meeting that uh, I reported that the uh, Ordinance Committee met on August 27th to review the signed ordinance as directed by the Town Council. Um, we began with a brief discussion uh, on the perceived problems with signage in town regardless of the rel relevance to the existing signed ordinance. 
Uh, we actually came up with a pretty substantial list. I won't go down through that list uh, tonight, uh, but pretty much wherever you can imagine signs in town, there are occasionally problems with them. Um, but uh, while most of the problems, we did find that most of the problems are addressed in some form or another in the ordinance. Um, and we did uh, reach consensus on a number of proposed revisions to the signed ordinance. And these revisions include adding a definition for permanent signs to the definition section in the beginning of the ordinance, limiting the number of times per year to three that on and off premises yard and garage sale signs may be posted for sales that are either conducted by the same people or held at the same location, allowing pick your own operations to post off premises signs for the duration of the picking season. Currently they must uh, erect them each day and take them down each night. We propose uh, adding the term home business to the provision that addresses signage for home occupation, recognizing that there is a difference between the two terms. Uh, in the section dealing with the town center zone and the various business zones, we would reference the business signs table that appear, tables that appear at the end of the ordinance as <coughs> Appendix A. We would change the current reference in the ordinance from the BOCA code to the IRC and IBC codes. This reflects reference to the international codes that are currently being used in town, uh, across the state, and, uh, and the nation, and in fact, internationally. We propose adding provision that the town shall have no responsibility or liability regarding signs that are confiscated due to the violation of the ordinance. And we have broadened slightly the definition of those who are endowed with enforcement uh, authority. Uh, those are the specific uh, revisions that we're proposing uh, to be acted on. Uh, in addition to the proposed amendments, though, the committee is also making further recommendations. We ask that the town council discuss gas station signs in workshop time. Uh, we, re we would recommend that a volunteer citizen committee on agricultural issues, as part of their deliberations, submit recommendations for fish farm and pick your own signs to the council for ordinance committee consideration, which we will be considering and that we recommend that the town send letters to businesses and organizations that post temporary signs notifying them of the town's uh, regulations. That concludes my report. Thank you, Jim. That was excellent. I now open the public hearing for the proposed amendments to the signed ordinance. I open the public hearing for proposed amendments to the signed ordinance. Is there anybody who would like to speak uh, regarding this issue? No? Okay. Therefore, I, I close the public hearing for the proposed amendments to the sign ordinance. I close the public hearing for the proposed amendments to the sign ordinance. Very good. Okay, we'll go on to item number 144. Someone like to make a motion? Jim. I would move that we approve the uh, amendments to the sign ordinance as they appear in your packets. We have a second. Second. Sarah. Okay. Any discussion, Cynthia? Yeah, I just have two points um, about the revisions on page four and page five. On page four, paragraph H, um, I think it needs to be worded a little bit differently. Okay. Um, the second sentence: up to two of these signs may be placed off premises, with any such off premises signs mm -hmm. may be in place and so on. Mm. My recommended um, revision, subject to David's overriding it, is the um, <laughs> second sentence would read, up to two of these signs may be placed off premises and may be in place during the duration of the picking season. So delete some and add and. Do you, do you accept the friendly amendment to your motion? Certainly and do. And then my second suggestion is on page five, paragraph O, um, just simply to say the town manager or his or her designee shall approve the placement of any temporary signage on municipal property along the right of way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Sarah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? All right. All in favor? So I can I say oh. <laughs> A broker stopped me today and pointed out that um, he had been told to take down all his 
auxiliary signs, not the ones directly in front of the house, but the ones that appeared on the road, which he did, and another broker in town had also um, abided by the rule and did that, but he pointed out that two others have not done that. And he said it's not so much the ordinance, but the enforcement, enforcement that he is finding unfair. Mike. Just, it is difficult to keep up with it all the time. As I think David mentioned earlier, the 70 homes on the market signs are going up all the time. And some of them, sometimes it's not as readily apparent mm -hmm. that the, the lot is on the side street, but they actually have frontage on the main road. There's a couple of them that I've looked at thinking ought to come down. And then you look at it a little bit longer and you, you see that they, that they uh, are in fact in keeping with the ordinance. But if anyone sees any sign they think is in violation, you know, give, give Bruce uh, Smith, the code enforcement officer, a call and we'll be glad to figure out. This ordinance gives us more teeth uh, if it's adopted to, to get rid of the signs and not have to depend simply on the code enforcement officer to do it before, under the rules, only the code enforcement officer could remove signs. Once this becomes effective 30 days from now, the hope is that he would designate other individuals in town as well to, to do it. That way we'll, we'll have better enforcement. And, you know, someone can't just put up, what we're getting is a lot of real estate folks will put up signs on Fridays and they know they get a free ride like this past weekend until Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we, we don't, we're not out there over the weekend enforcing real estate signs. And then you see other signs like 1-800-GOT-JUNK uh, down on 77, yeah. Yeah. you know. They're very irritating. But this they person all over the place. suggested that uh, it was the, the, the current um, procedure you have to go through was very onerous because you had to notify the broker. Then they got 48 hours to comply. And if they did, and then blah, blah, blah. And he said if they could just have it so that Bruce Smith or someone could go out and pull up the song. Is that? Th this ordinance will help with that process. Good. Okay, David. I feel bad about even raising this question. Okay. <laughs> we would expect but, nothing less, David. <laughs> if we look at the definition of permanent sign, yes. it's, it refers to a sign um, intended to be in place for an indeterminate period that's longer than 30 days. Well, I guess I'm not sure what that means. What if it's a sign that's intended to be in place for a determinate period that's longer than 30 days? In other words, I intend this sign to be in place for 75 days. What is it? May I respond to that? Yes, please. That, that does not happen, David. You know, you, you'd think that it might. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you, there's other provisions in there for temporary signs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you know, generally signs are up for an indeterminate period. Uh, because it's... Yeah, but a temporary it's, sign is defined as something for a short, fixed period of time. What's that mean? What's a short, fixed period? Five days? Less than, Less than 30 days? It's not, def it's not defined, and I think it's deliberately not defined. But how can we ever enforce an issue with a temporary or permanent sign if we don't know what either one is? This is just a definition. If you look at... If you look at the standards that follow, there are certain time frames listed in most instances, uh, and that, that therefore covers it. Well, I think it's hard to say that it's just a definition, since the definition is really a sort of the controlling. It's pretty easy for me to say, it. David. <laughs> Ordinances. I think um, of a permanent sign like a business sign, um, you know, like uh, Rudy's on the Cape. That's a, that's a, I would consider that a permanent sign. Am I, am I misinterpreting it? No. That's right? Yeah, or the IGA. IGA. It's there for an, we don't know how long. That's it's indeterminate. It's indeterminate. indeterminate. It's longer than 30 Whereas days. Whereas temporary, how, you, however, you say, I intend to have this sign up for X number of days. I don't intend to argue with David, I mean, though, just, because he's no, a much better lawyer. I guess my point is, if I a sign, and, I, and somebody says, hey, you've got it, you know, you can't have that sign there. And I say, um, no, I, I intend for this to be up for 180 days. There, if there are, if a, I could, it's a determinate period of time, and that's my intent. Strike the word indeterminate. It, David makes a good point, because there are places out by the mall, that Halloween store, oh, yeah. you know, that's supposed so to be in place. It's open for 60 days. How about in place for a period for a longer period. than 30 days? Yeah, I would take out the... Take out indeterminate. And 
and so indeterminate. It's, so it's for a period yes. longer than 30 days. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's good. So it Mark still that. leaves a loophole. Yeah, it does. Well, is, then we is can it 30 consecutive we'll days? What if I put it up to 29 and take the it The ordinance committee is all about loopholes. <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so that's an amendment. <laughs> Cynthia, do you, you have all this with Well, if we're going to, I was actually, when I read the definition of permanent sign, I was surprised that, that it was relying on a building that is intended to be. I mean, usually there's not like a mens rea in a definition. I mean, we'd have to establish that the intent is longer, that it, yeah, for longer. How about just, a permanent sign is any structure, display, logo, device, representation, which is designed or used to advertise or call attention to any item, business activity, or place, and is visible from an outside building and is in place for a period of longer than 30 days. I mean, I don't know where the intent is. Then what is in your before 30 days? Yeah. Temporary. Yeah. All right. That's always but one the, or the other. The, but there's different know. standards for temporary than permanent. Yeah, that's so the intended. Yeah. Well, I, I hate to. This probably isn't the time and place to do this. That's why I hated. Okay. I started by saying I hate to even bring this up because sort of drafting by committee in the middle of a meeting is not the right. right. Can we can we do it. vote it in and let David edit it? I think no. we can, and we could look at I mean, uh, 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 alterations table. later. I mean, that's not there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, let's let's do that. Okay, why don't we, can we continue revisit. then? All in favor? Wait wait a minute. So what's the motion? The motion is to table. adopt the sign ordinance amendments with the um, to adopt it as amended as amended. Okay. I just want okay. to know what the There were a couple of minor changes, change. but Ruth and got them down. Yeah, we're good. I think we're on board, right? Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, we will move to item number 145, Shore Road Pathway Study Committee. And who would like to? If our clerk would reflect the fact that I didn't raise my hand for that vote. <laughs> so I apparently <laughs> abstain. Oh, you abstain. Okay. You should absolutely no. One, one abstention. <laughs> Sorry about that. Did you, did you, you. want to give me a chance to vote no? Or would you rather vote no, David? Um, <laughs> no, I can. We can. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't get a chance to raise my hand. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I thought it was all. <laughs> oh, well. um, all right. Item number 145. Would someone like to make a motion? Or would you like to introduce it? Cynthia? <coughs> I'm happy to introduce it and make a motion. All right, why don't we Item 145 is the Shore Road Pathway Study Committee um, recommendation um, that I'm hoping the Town Council adopts, and it charges the Shore Road Pathway Study Committee uh, to study the potential for creating an off-road path adjacent to Shore Road that should be designed with sensitivity to the character of Shore Road and in collaboration with property owners abutting Shore Road. Um, the committee, if it is uh, uh, so charged by the town council, uh, will consist of nine persons, um, one from the town council, one from the conservation commission, and seven appointed uh, by the appointments committee. And um, the Shore Road Pathway Study committee was a recommendation made by the Road Safety Working Group, which I have the honor of chairing. And um, the, the vision is to create um, a plan, a preliminary plan of an off-road path that's adjacent to Shore Road. So it's different from a green belt path, but adjacent to Shore Road. Um, and we, this is a long-term project. The charge um, would or the charge uh, what is that? says that the committee will work through fiscal year 2009 and possibly thereafter. So this isn't a, a quick, uh, by any means, knee-jerk effort. It's a hopefully going to be a deliberative process by a committee. And I move that the town council um, authorizes the creation of this committee as it appears in item 145 in your packet. We have a second. Second. Marianne, any discussion? Yeah. Um, I, as a, a member of the appointments committee, I just would urge people uh, to, uh, this is going to be advertised. It'll be on the website. Applications will be on the website. And um, we look forward to your applications. In particular, I know we will be looking for 
residents or property owners from within the Shore Road corridor and adjacent streets, but we do want representation from the whole community. So I'm just putting in a plug to send in your applications, please. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Just an informational question. Are we expecting much uh, budget impact from the formation of this committee? No. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Not in the near term. <laughs> okay. Any other? Okay. All in favor? That is unanimous. Yeah, I counted that one. <laughs> right. Let's move on to item number 146 picnic shelter and filming. The recommendation. Michael, you want to introduce this? Yes, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission last uh, changed the fees for the picnic shelter uh, before 2004 in a vote of the Town Council in December of 2003. They're recommending some adjustments. They're also recommending some adjustments in the, the fee for location, uh, the location fee for filming uh, and for commercial photography. We have a, uh, would someone like to make a motion? Ann. I will uh, move the adoption of these fees as laid out in the September 24th memo. I do have a question. Okay. We have second. Second. second motion. Yeah. Okay. My question is just for the manager. Um, how are these fees enforced? I mean, how do we, how do we ensure that people pay these fees? The picnic shelter fees or the, the filming location well, fees? Well, both. The picnic shelter, it's, it's posted. Uh, it gives first right to reservation. If it's not reserved and people go to the shelter, that's, that's fine. Uh, you, you know, it's only if you want to guarantee a reservation. During the prime season, you need a reservation. But if, if folks during the off season go and use the shelter, that's perfectly fine. So there, there's really no enforcement. But there's also, a, there's a schedule posted there all the time. The rangers check it out. The rangers clean it. We provide, we, you know, we do provide services to uh, this group. The location fees is, is a more interesting issue. Uh, a lot of the, the still photography, if it doesn't have any impact on the park, we don't charge. What we do is we speak to everyone that comes in and tries to figure out, will it have any impact on the park at all? We also, if we work very closely with the main film office. And if it's for a commercial film, uh, you know, the snow falling on cedars, for example, they filmed some scenes there. And that, that fee was probably seven or eight thousand by the time we get done with the number of days they were, they were done. Uh, they're charged. But if it's, if it's something that the state really wants for the promotion of the state of Maine, that, that has strong, strong promotional value, sometimes the fee is, is nil. It, it, we, we try to work, and that's what the, that final line is about. We try to work it through, uh, depending on what the activity is, depending on what the impact, and a lot of it is, in fact, negotiated. But these are the, these are the when we first get the call, and a lot of them come from California, from different products, these are the fees we tell them. And one follow-up, which is, I was wondering if it was intended that these location fees apply. I'm thinking, in particular, of people taking uh, senior photo, you know, the commercial photographers who take senior photos and that kind of stuff. I wouldn't think that would be our intent, but I just wanted to make sure I understood. No, we, we usually don't even get calls on those. But if we get calls, it's, you know, one model, you know, some still photography, those, those we don't charge for. Okay. It's only if, if they want a guarantee of some exclusivity of space uh, or they're bringing in, as sometimes they do, you know, 100 people for doing filming and, you know, they set up the catering truck and the rest of it. We, we try to gauge in, in interviewing them exactly what is their framework. Right now is the busiest time uh, for filming. There was one done today that was mostly offshore, but it was Mary Ann saw it a little bit in the park. Uh, the Kraft family is building a big uh, shopping mall attraction feature in what's now the parking lot, or was the parking lot at uh, Foxborough Stadium and the New England Patriots. And they wanted a couple lobster boats that were filmed off the park. Uh, and it's something, again, the main film office was really pushing because there's going to be apparently big, huge screens there promoting all six of the New England states. And this is part of the main piece, the, the main publicity, the, the main 
Department of Economic Development was working with the crafts, the representatives of the craft family in, in doing this. Thank you. I had a question about um, fees charged to um, political action committees. I know the Obama campaign was initially scheduled to have an event, and I'm just curious about whether or not we have a standard fee for those kinds of uh, activities. That's separate as part of the Fort Wayne's Park use policy. It's, oh. It goes based on the number of expected visitors. And we also recover all of our costs, too. And, and even these fees here, if they want to hire a police officer or whatever, all of those fees are in addition to, to this here. This is just use. If they want any extra services, it's more money. Thank you. As the, the Obama campaign would have been had they chosen to come. And that's a lot of times the fees drive a lot of events away. David, did you have a question? Um, I did, but our manager answered it without me even having to ask it. Okay. Super. All right. Anybody else? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. All right. Next, one, item 147, wellness benefit. Okay. Cynthia. I would move that we adopt the clarification of the wellness benefit policy. Uh, in the personnel code for the town of Cape Elizabeth as it is set forth in the memorandum to us, um, item 147. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. We will go to item 148, uh, bed and breakfast. Cynthia. I would move that we recommend um, the item presented by um, Off the Wall Antiques and Carl Dittrich to uh, look into the possibility of permitting bed and breakfast in the RA zone to the planning board. Jim, did you want to second that? I saw that hand go sure. up. Sure. Okay. Second. And um, any discussion? Um, just a, a clarification, Cynthia, you had said recommended, and I would support just a referral to the planning board. I, I think it raises a number of issues in a town that's largely residential. I'm not sure where I am on it, but I would want to be clear that it's just a referral and it's not a recommendation to the planning board. Is that what you meant, Cynthia? I'll accept that friendly amendment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And Jim, you good with that? If there's no permanent signs involved. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> as long as they're not intended to be permanent. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Very good. Now we will go to item number 149, election items. Who would like to go? I would like to um, move that Ruth Noble be appointed as the election warden and the warrant, and also approve that we approve the warrant for the November 6, 2007 election. Second. David. Any discussion? I just have a clarification. The, the intent, uh, Ruthie, is that you're being appointed the warden for all elections until replaced. Is that correct? Just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. And Thank That's you. what I meant without That's even knowing said, that I, just, I meant it. I just wanted to make sure that everyone caught that. Thank you, Mike. Okay, all in favor? Okay, very good. You're on board, Ruth. All right. Good to have you. <laughs> okay. Item number 150, appointments committee recommendation. Yeah. Um, I would, first of all, uh, this has to do with the Alternative Energy Committee, and I'd first of all like to thank all the applicants. We had some really amazingly well-qualified people from all different, uh, covering all different aspects of the energy and alternative energy fields, from energy as a commodity down to people who know how to manufacture and install alternative energy devices, and it, it was amazing. It was so impressive. I was in awe of these people. We did have more applicants, uh, excellent applicants, than places on the committee. Um, and I would urge anyone who did not happen to be uh, appointed tonight uh, to please feel free to attend meetings 
and uh, of the Alternative Energy Committee and uh, provide input just as private citizens because I think they had a lot to offer. So with that being said, the Appointments Committee recommends the following citizens to serve on the Alternative Energy Committee, and I would make this a motion that we appoint Wyman Briggs, Ted Hawks, Peter Ingraham, Brigitte Kingsbury, Alan Leishness, Bill Slack, and David Witten. Okay, we have a second. Second. Marianne. And is there any discussion? I would just like to make one comment on this. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to see this. And I spoke with the alternative energy expert at the Greater Portland Council of Governments today. He, he's really excited that we're doing this. <coughs> and we're looking at doing a similar thing, uh, uh, developing an alternative energy committee for the, for the, for the Greater Portland Council of Governments, so uh, region-wide. So this will be good. So I'm pretty excited about it. All right, all in favor. Okay, very good. And Paul, I have a second um, motion that I'd like to make. Yes, please. Um, we have, uh, in a, there's a copy in your packet of the statement of policy on appointments to standing boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. And the appointments committee uh, is recommending a slight change to number 11 uh, listed in that policy. The intent of our uh, change is, is still not to allow employees of the town, including town and school employees, to serve on standing boards and commissions. However, there are some instances where some types of employees, um, it's, it's not really a conflict for a resident to serve on a board while volunteering uh, for the town or, or working very part-time for the town. So what we are recommending is that um, employees of the town of Cape Elizabeth may not serve on standing boards and commissions except by ex officio appointment and following is the added language. This limitation does not apply to individuals who are hired by the town to serve as temporary election workers or wardens, as occasional instructors in the community services programs, or as volunteer fire rescue and fire police personnel. Such individuals may serve on a board or commission unrelated to their work for the town. So I'd make that a motion. That's quite a motion. Very good. <laughs> Second. Okay, Mary. Any uh, discussion? I'm just going to wait a second for Cynthia. I don't want her to miss. That's fine. Um, that's great. Great work to the Appointments Committee. And I, oh, and I do want to thank Deborah Lane. Um, she is the person, uh, the staff person who basically keeps me straight and keeps the appointments committee uh, knowing what we're doing. And she puts together all the packets, and I really appreciate her help. She does a good job. Yeah, I, I, and absolutely. So thank you, Ann, for bringing that up, because uh, we have some outstanding boards and commissions, and uh, that takes, you know, a lot of work to make that happen. Okay, all in favor? Very good. Okay, next, item number 151. Who would like to make a proposal? Jim. I would move that the town accept the deeds to acquire the 42.85% share of the Levitt Gares property from the Janet Jordan Adderton Trust in the amount of $20,448. Do we have a second? Second. second. Sarah. Could you briefly explain it? Yeah, and Mike, could you please? I wanted to, Maureen made this map for us today, which I wanted to briefly go over. So I don't know how many of you can see it with the podium, but just to give you the bearings, this is Shore Road, this is Fort Williams, this is the Robinson parcel of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Uh, this land here was acquired from, uh, it's in back of Stonegate, and this surrounded by green is the 18 acres of the, the uh, the Love It Is property. Just to give you a sense, it's exactly one fifth the size of Fort Williams Park. So, you know, it's not uh, insubstantial. Uh, you also can see from this map and why we, we colored it in is to really get the sense of the northern end of town, all these neighborhoods, uh, and the connection to this whole area with the eventual plan to go out to the town center. This is really a key parcel, but it doesn't quite do it. Uh, there's a couple of streets in here, lots. There's not 
a direct connection yet to anywhere that connects to the Oak Crest area. That's something that the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust has been working on uh, to, uh, to see if that happens. Just a discussion in or the earlier item about the, uh, the comprehensive plan. You know, Fort Williams Park was acquired with a $200,000 uh, bond by the town in December of 1964. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust piece here, Robinson Woods, was acquired with a generous donation from the late John Robinson, uh, was acquired with $250,000 donation from the town, and $500,000 from the land trust and their other sources. And you know, it was, it, the point is a real partnership uh, between a private landowner of the town and the, the other agencies as well that helped. Uh, the Stonegate land was actually quite in two parcels, one with the development of Dyer Pond and one with the development of Stonegate. And that's an example of clustering and open space. And you know, if you didn't have clustering and open space, for example, this is Cranbrook, there was no open space. If the same things had been applied in Stonegate, you would not have all this pink blob in the middle. And that really shows, you know, back your, your vote earlier tonight, the importance of, of having clustering and the importance of having a set aside for open space because without this major piece it doesn't work. I would like to point out that there is an easement that cuts right over to Fort Williams. It, it does actually not land on and without the map doesn't show it, there's also one that cuts out right to Dyer Pond Road. Some of you may have walked these paths that the uh, Conservation Commission has done quite a bit on it. Uh, <coughs> this is being acquired for its assessed value, uh, which is not a substantial amount. It's, it's valued quite low because of how complicated it was. With this 42% acquisition, we now own 76% of the property. Uh, of the, the balance of 24%, uh, some of it is with dead end tracks that we can't trace. Uh, we, we have names. We are now sending tax bills to those dead ends and our assumption is the bills will come back and after two and a half years we will have foreclosed on those interests. There's one party that owns 2% that hasn't uh, been interested in talking to us yet, but I would like to reopen those discussions now that the 42% has been acquired and they might see the wisdom of it. This land was the Jedediah Lovett land from uh, 1876. Uh, so it just shows uh, you know how long sometimes things take. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's really significant in terms of connecting the developed piece of land to all of this approximately 300 acres of open space with the hope, you know, eventually of continuing down to the town center. So it's, it's really a key parcel. I would like to particularly thank uh, two individuals, one Bob Dodd, who was the instigator of uh, a lot of this, and he, he, he might appreciate the term instigator, uh, but uh, he really pushed us. We, we had acquired a small interest on it, and he sent a couple of emails, and you know, as much as said the town can do a lot better than that, and called a meeting, and you know, it was a little, it was a little tense there a few times, but you know, sometimes to get things done, you have that friction. But anyway, it, uh, you know, I think because of his effort, his vision, it's 70, it's now 76 percent with this acquisition, and I also really, again, as I've done in emails, thank Tom Leahy and the, the firm of Monaghan Lake, who have done just tremendous title work uh, and has done all of the one-on-one the -on -one contacts. Uh, there was one of the women, uh, Florence Morris, who was involved in this, uh, lived uh, at, out in Deeran Pavilion, out on Forest Avenue, and Tom went and visited her at, at her place there. And, uh, you know, when she agreed with him, had been discussing it with her family as well. And it's, it's just been a real cooperative relationship with the Love It Is. Uh, but the, who don't even know each other, by the way. Uh, but particularly, you know, the, the, the key person in it has been Tom Leahy, who has uh, made the contacts, gotten it done. So, I, I, pardon me for the lateness of the hour and spending a little more time on it, but I, I do think it's significant and uh, really want to thank at this point uh, the Janet Jordan Adderton Living Trust uh, and Mary Kay Barnett, who's the daughter of Janet Jordan Adderton who worked on this with an attorney, Ray Bradford, up in Bangor, so. Any questions? Sir. When you say it, you want eventually to connect it up to the town center, how, how are you gonna do that? The land trust has discussions from time to time with property owners 
uh, further south of this. And you know, those those discussions are always ongoing from time to time. As you know, if you look at the Green Belt Plan, it shows eventual connection. There's open space there. There's land that's not developed, uh, and you know, those those are the types of parcels that the land trust talks to. But it's been a you know, this has been a real cooperative relationship with the land trust. And you know, I think the, the desire is to place a conservation easement on this piece, and you know that's something that you know, we need further discussion on. But obviously, the land trust would be the, the leading candidate uh, to protect this this particular piece with a uh, with a conservation easement. Good work. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Outstanding. There's some more open space. For the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> All the time we're talking about this comprehensive plan, we've been saving space so the last few months. So that's a good thing. Um, any uh, further discussion? Okay. All in favor of acceptance of the Lovett Heirs parcel in the Janet, from the Janet Jordan Addison Trust. Okay. Unanimous. Excellent. And then we move to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. No? Okay. Just if, if anyone has universal waste, computers, whatever, it's this Saturday is the day to bring that to the uh, public works garage in the morning. Uh, October 13th, right? Uh, that's this Saturday. Yes. What's the time frame? It's in the morning. It's on the website. I, I always hesitate to, but it's in the morning. Okay, very good. All right. Do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Yeah. Eight. Cynthia. Okay, and uh, yes? Oh, everybody. Oh, okay. All in favor? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>